Okay, welcome. My name is John West. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute, which I co-founded with Steve Meyer, philosopher of science, uh, back in 1996, the very same year that Dr. Michael Behe published his landmark book, Darwin's Black Box. Thank you for joining our webinar today to celebrate Dr. Behe's newest and latest book just out last week. Uh, Dr. Behe is, of course, a biochemist. He is a professor of biological sciences at Lehigh University. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute, a best-selling author, and an all-around great guy. <laughs> um, and his new book is calling, is called, let's go, uh, if I can, yep, there. His new book is called A Mousetrap for Darwin. Michael J. Behe answers his critics. The book is now available on Amazon.com in paperback, hardcover, and Kindle versions. Uh, I hope you've ordered your copy already or will soon do so. Uh, this book has a special place in my heart because I actually encourage Mike to think about putting it together because I was dumbfounded, frankly, by what I will call the fake criticisms of Michael Behe's work. Like fake news, fake criticisms are criticisms that aren't actually real. They may seem real, but they aren't. Probably the top fake criticism of Michael Behe is that he has not engaged with his critics or with their criticisms of his ideas, which is so far from the truth, it's like an alternate reality. I've read most of Behe's critics and I've read his responses to them, very careful, methodical, winsome, and devastating responses. Uh, usually Mike's responses have been so spot on that his critics are reduced to pretending that the responses don't exist. I think that's telling. If you are a serious critic of someone, you do the hard work of actually responding uh, to their arguments. If you're a fake critic, you come up with fake criticisms, like falsely claiming that your opponent won't engage with his critics, even though he has. So I thought, it would be great to call the bluff of these fake critics. I thought, let's collect Behe's extensive responses to critics. Surely we'd have enough for a 300 page book. I was wrong. When Mike collected all of his responses, we found we had a 750 page book. So we decided we had to be selective and uh, reduce some of the material. Uh, and we were able to reduce it to a really sparse 556 pages which includes new introductions throughout the book, as well as some other unpublished material. Um, just sort of to give you an overview, uh, his book uh, has eight sections. Really the first section, first two sections deal with debates over Behe's first book, Darwin's Black Box. The next four sections deal with debates inspired by his second book, The Edge of Evolution. Uh, another section deals with uh, debates arising from his book, Darwin Devolves. And then there, a final section explores the need for genuine discussion on the merits of intelligent design. As Behe writes, intelligent design is one topic badly in need of adult discussion. <laughs> I think he's right. So this is a substantial book. Uh, if anyone tells you that Dr. Behe hasn't responded to his critics or that he's been refuted, tell them to read this book and engage with its arguments. Otherwise, they should just zip it, in my view. If they haven't been willing to engage in uh, arguments, you know, the arguments with Behe's responses, then I don't think they're real or serious critics. I really do hope you get this book because I suspect you'll discover a lot of things you didn't know Behe has written. Uh, and you definitely will see how his ideas have survived the critics and stood the test of time. But don't just take my word for it. Here are the words of two scientists who have already read the book. A Mousetrap for Darwin provides perhaps the most comprehensive and incisive critique of neo-Darwinism currently in print. That's biologist Michael Denton. And of course, Mike Denton knows something about this because his book in the 1980s, Evolution of Theory and Crisis, helped really start the ball rolling in many ways and in fact helped inspire Mike Behe's work. And so Mike Denton says this is the single best place now to get the uh, comprehensive critique of neo-Darwinism. And then we have world-renowned chemist Marcus Eberlin, a member of uh, the Brazil's National Academy of Sciences, one of the top people in the field of mass spectrometry. He said this, over the years I followed Michael Behe's work in building an arsenal of arguments for intelligent design. And I have followed the desperate attempts of mainstream evolutionists to discredit that work. 
A few of the critiques are superficially persuasive, but they hold up best if you don't think too hard about the biochemical details of their evolutionary scenarios. If you fear to doubt Darwinism, read further at your own peril. I love that. And I think it's actually true, um, which is another reason I love it. So with that, let me stop sharing that and let's get started. Uh, we're going to, as far as format, we're going to begin with some of my questions for Mike Behe. And then after that, we will turn to your questions in the audience. Feel free to start submitting your questions right away using the question tab uh, sort of below your, your screen. Uh, if you want to tell us what city or country you're participating from, uh, if you want to be anonymous, turn on the anonymous function. Otherwise, I might use your first name when, when talking about your question. And so with that, we are going to get started. So Mike, uh, thank you, first of all, for joining us from uh, Pennsylvania this morning. And this morning, my time, afternoon, I guess, your, your time. Um, <laughs> First of all, I decided to ask, what do you hope this new book accomplishes? Well, uh, you've covered some of it in your introduction, and, and that is that uh, uh, when you have a discussion, I put forward an argument, and then other people put forth their, their counter arguments, and the idea goes, then, well, I consider those, and, and I either say they're good counter arguments or not, and, and I reply, and I've replied a lot, but uh, over the years, I've noticed that not many critics have realized that I responded, uh, and they ignore the responses, uh, why the criticism uh, doesn't apply, and they, they bring the same thing up over and over and over again. So I just thought that bringing these, all these critique or all these responses together in one book would give everybody a convenient a place to go when they hear a criticism of ID and, and see if it's been uh, addressed before. Yeah, some of your critics, it reminds me of the old film, uh, Groundhog Day. They just, they just keep recycling the same old things as if uh, there had been no responses and they just don't, I, mean, I think it's because it's too difficult for them to deal with the actual responses. Yeah, the, the worst part of, if I might add here, the worst yeah. part was my, the, reju the review in the journal Science last year of my newest book, uh, Darwin Devolves, where the authors just repeated old uh, criticisms and it, you said I had not responded to things that I had discussed extensively on the, on the internet and other places. Uh, so yeah, this, this is a needed book, I think. So in your view, maybe apart from the, the claim that you haven't responded, what's the least serious or most frivolous or not you know, serious criticism your work has received over the years? Well, uh, in, in my view, the least serious criticism is the response that, that we're not allowed to consider design, that science isn't allowed to, to invoke design because some rule forbids us from doing so. Uh, and that, in my view, is that's ridiculous because you've got the evidence right here and uh, our reasoning processes, the same ones that we use to conclude design anywhere else, uh, uh, points strongly to design. So uh, reality can't be circumscribed by rules made up by people. We have to just follow the evidence where it leads. Yeah, I think that's actually really good that uh, what you just said, that they try to rule out discussion from the start. Um, and that is a pretty frivolous criticism. Um, now, what about, let's turn the tables on the other side. What's the most serious criticism you think uh, your work has received over the years? Well, it uh, depends on how you mean that. Uh, in my, uh, in my um, completely unbiased view, <laughs> no criticism has actually worked against intelligent design. Sorry, you know, I'd, I'd like to point to something just to, to show how open-minded I am, but not, I haven't come across any criticism that has made me reconsider anything. But one criticism I think has done damage to the discussion. And that is when people try to, uh, to uh, redefine terms 
that I use in my books, particularly irreducible complexity. That was, uh, I, I defined it, of course, uh, as uh, a system that needs a lot of parts. And if you take one part away, the system doesn't work. And uh, in particular, a man named Kenneth Miller, who's a professor of biology at Brown University said, no, no, I, he's going to say that irreducible complexity means if you take a piece out of a system, you, aren't, you can't use that piece for any other role. You can't use it in any other system. And, you know, that's, and that's, of course, a straw man, and it's just set up so that you can push it down. And, of course, I responded to it, but it was a, a response was ignored, and it's gotten a lot of traction. For some reason, uh, a number of folks in the media uh, ran with that. And I, I remember a big story in the Wall Street Journal showing how intelligent design critics have been refuted because you can use pieces of systems for other uh, purposes. So uh, it's, not a, it's not an intellectually strong criticism, but it is a, uh, it is a rhetorically strong one and it, it's gotten, it's gotten uh, it has derailed the discussion in, in many instances. Mm, yeah, I think oh, that's a good point. Um, now, I grew up in a household where my sisters just loved Star Trek, so we got it <laughs> every day. I admit, I didn't love it quite as much, partly because it was every day, it, like in reruns, we were watching various parts of it. But I know in your book, you make a couple of references to Star Trek, so I thought I'd use those as a springboard for a couple of questions. Um, first, you write that quite literally, life is like the Borg in Star Trek. How so? Well, uh, the Borg is from uh, the second iteration of the TV uh, Star Trek show. And they are supposed to be some sort of half human, half machine hybrid. And famously, they are supposed to run on what is called nanotechnology, these mm. tiny little machines that uh, are inside their bodies. And there's one episode where uh, Captain Picard is is going to be absorbed into the Borg, and you can see under a microscope these little metallic, clunky, evil-looking machines next to red blood cells in in his uh, in his blood, and he's being absorbed by nanotechnology. Well, it turns out that science has discovered that we do have nanotechnology inside us. We are run by nanomachines that uh, if you look inside the cell, which of course Darwin uh, didn't have any much of an idea about, it seemed like a piece of jelly back in those times. If you look inside the cell, there are literally machines made out of molecules. Of course, the flagellum uh, that we talked about, but also the cilium and uh, kinesin motors and and uh, all sorts of things. Nothing in the cell happens by chance. So just like in the show, we are run by nanotechnology. So we are the Borg. Okay, that's great. Um, you also um, point out, you say in another part of the book, nobody on earth is the reincarnation of Mr. Spock, either singly or collectively. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Mr. Spock in Star Trek is supposed to be a very cool, logical, you know, uh, person, uh, almost a machine-like, computer-like, uh, and he only pays attention to the data and doesn't let his any emotions get in his way of of coming to a conclusion. Of course, every third or fourth episode, he breaks down and cries, but you know, that's just bad, <laughs> just bad writing, but that's supposed to be his, uh, his persona. And many people think of scientists uh, in general as akin to that image of Mr. Spock. You know, they would, you know, they just look at the data and come straight to their conclusions by, by logic and, and facts. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's simply not the case. Scientists are people too, and they've got their mm -hmm. own 
preferences, their own worldviews, the, their own way that they want things to be. And so since design and evolution and these, these are big ideas about, uh, about life and about fundamental ways in which we view ourselves in the world. And so nobody is going to be completely objective. Everybody's going to have uh, some views that they bring to the table. No, that's right. We're not, we're not just like Spock. Um, although, as you point out, Spock does. <laughs> half, I guess from his half part human parentage, I guess that's where yeah, it's right, from. Yeah, his mom. Um, <laughs> his mom. Um, now, I find it really fascinating just how much you've gotten inside the heads of Darwinists. The very scientists who say, you know, they find evidence for Darwinism is so overwhelming that there isn't any evidence of design and biology seem obsessed with trying to disprove some of the things that you've pointed out. So you write in, in this new book, emphasizing in one's paper how the results falsify irreducible complexity or easily explain some astounding molecular system virtually guarantees that it will be accepted by Nature, Science, or some other top tier journal, usually accompanied by a story in the New York Times. My question is, what do you think this shows about the real state of Darwinism? On the one hand, we have these top scientists saying there is no scientific debate over Darwin or design. It's not a scientific mm -hmm. question. It's tantamount to believing the flat earth. On the other hand, these same scientists seem to spend a whole lot of time trying to refute something they say isn't worth refuting. It's like you've taken over their brains. You've set the terms of debate for them. So what do you think these efforts to refute you really show about the state over Darwin and design? Well, it, it shows that Darwinism is much more fragile than people admit, than scientists admit, than, than the media admit, and so on. Uh, not only my stuff, but uh, about five, six years ago, uh, two letters uh, were sent by different groups of scientists and published in the journal Nature, the leading uh, science journal in the world, under the title, Does Evolution Need a Rethink? And one group of scientists said, no, no, Darwinism is great. The other group says, yeah, you know, there's lots of problems it can't answer. We would better start thinking about other things. So uh, in my view, uh, Darwinism is sustained mostly by sociology. It's kind of what people learned in school uh, everybody agrees it's true, and somebody who says, wait, no, look at these tough questions, it's not true, threatens to kind of break the consensus and, and um, expose it to very hard questions. And since a consensus is pretty much the only thing supporting Darwinism, it doesn't have any, any evidence that it can uh, make the, the uh, fantastic structures of life, then people consciously or unconsciously really try hard to stop any criticisms of it from, uh, from getting out there. Mm. I think that's right. So um, as we're winding down our discussion, there's one question that I couldn't let this opportunity go by with ask, asking you about the scintillating topic of the type three secretory system and the bacterial flagellum. I am still amazed when I come across new comments online, especially in the comment section of some of our YouTube videos that assert something like, Behe has been refuted because we all know the so-called irreducibly complex flagellum evolved from the simpler structure known as the type three secretion system. Now, you've already alluded to this type of argument earlier in our conversation, and I know you've patiently refuted this objection about the type three secretion system time and again, but it's almost like a zombie that just keeps coming back. So I thought I'd give you a chance to address it here. Did the bacterial flagellum evolve through Darwinian means uh, from a simpler structure known as the type three secretion system? Or do we think, or no. do we have good evidence to think that? Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we do not have any evidence to support that. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, when I wrote about the bacterial flagellum in Darwin's black box, uh, the ability of it to build itself by pumping proteins out through a hollow tube to the outside to make the long flagellum wasn't known. And then later it was discovered that it was more complex 
than anybody knew because it could do that. Besides being a rotary motor, it could also be a, a protein pump. Uh, and I, I thought it was, you know, a, a wonderful show of chutzpah for Darwinists to say, well, now it's more complex. And, and so, you know, it's, it, we can explain it uh, now. Uh, in fact, the type three secretory system, which use a, uses a, a handful of parts uh, that are similar to ones in the flagellum, uh, is a sophisticated machine in its own right. And no Darwinist has explained how that could occur. And no one has explained how it could go from a type three secretory system uh, to a flagellum. All they've said is that here's this one machine and here's this other machine. And, and uh, they uh, uh, imagine that they could uh, come together. Uh, but um, uh, additionally, that scenario requires that the type three secretory system somehow come first and then give rise to something uh, uh, even more complex. And it turns out that work in the past few decades has shown that uh, it seems like the flagellum came first, that the flagellum uh, showed up in life well before the type three secretory system and that perhaps the type three is a degradatory product of the flagellum. And while that fits in just fine with a theory of purposeful intelligent design, where a complex machine is made where, which can uh, break down to give other useful parts, it's, it's very difficult to square with a Darwinian uh, explanation. So uh, yeah, no, uh, I've I've written about this a lot, and you'll you can find this in the uh, in the new book as well. And and no, it, just like a, a zombie, it keeps coming back, but but it's it's uh, not living. <laughs> okay, great. Um, final question for me before I, I begin to get to the, all the questions we have. Actually, dozens of questions have been submitted, so I want to get to those. But my final question is: at the very end of this new book, you write. The great thing about science is not that it's never wrong, but that it's relentless. I wonder if you could just comment on that or discuss what you mean by that. Yeah, it's, you know, scientists are fallible and they make mistakes, but if you keep plugging away, then you'll stumble over, uh, you'll, you can stumble over truth or, or reality uh, eventually, whether you welcome it uh, or not. So uh, in the past, we've had theories like the ether, where people thought that outer space was filled with some mysterious gas-like substance. And But as, as science kept plugging along, that was shown not to be the case. And uh, so uh, the as science thought it had an idea to uh, help explain where life comes from, Darwin's theory of evolution. But uh, Darwin didn't know about many things that we know about today, didn't know about the genetic code and molecular machines and, and so on. And as science continued to plug away, its, its, own, uh, its own results uh, are leading it into a, uh, a clearer view of, of what life is and how life uh, must have come about. So as long as you keep trying, <laughs> you're going to make some progress. Okay, great. Well, now we have, like I said, dozens of questions, and we have several hundred people on, on our, our webinar, and they're from all over the United States, from the Czech Republic, from Scotland, from Turkey. So we have people from all over. So I apologize beforehand if I don't get to your question. I'm trying to pick those that would be the most interesting to people and also um, you know, that, that aren't duplicative. Uh, let's see. There are a few questions relating just to this book. Uh, one person actually asked, after, you know, completing a book that was, was so substantial, like Darwin Devolves, how do you have the time and where do you get all the energy to produce a new book? <laughs> so. Well, uh, yeah, um, it, well, it turns out that uh, most of these things were written already and, and in scattered, uh, mm -hmm publications. And so all I had to do was search my hard drive and okay. uh, bring some of them together and then write introductions and a couple of new pieces because 
uh, they uh, caused newer criticisms, uh, required them. Uh, so it wasn't nearly as hard as writing uh, uh, the other three books. Additionally, I had lots and lots of help from the Discovery Institute, uh, in particular, uh, Jonathan Witt, mm -hmm. who uh, put things together, edited things for clarity and, and so on. So uh, this, this was comparatively easy. <laughs> okay, a couple more questions just about the book itself, then we'll get into other more specific ones. Uh, someone asked, would you recommend a newbie to read Darwin's Black Box first before reading this new book? Yes, sure. Uh, you have to know what the basic argument is, and Darwin's black box uh, puts it most clearly because it talks about what the foundation of life is like, talks about how we perceive design. Uh, yeah, so that would be the best uh, book to read first. And then one other question again about the book itself, uh, someone asking about what level of technical knowledge should you have to be able to read this new book? Well, uh, it's uh, all of my all of my writings are for a broad general public that has, you know, uh, not, not necessarily any technical expertise, uh, high school level biology, something like that. So uh, everybody uh, could read it. A couple articles are more technical than others, but they all uh, can be understood uh, by the general public. Yeah, I'd just like to accentuate that. Mike is one of, I think, the preeminent scientists of our times who can actually communicate in a way that even those of us who uh, you know, may not have a specialty in biochemistry certainly can understand. And so I encourage you, if you're interested in these topics, get the book. You, you don't have to be a scientist in order to understand, except a lot of them do go into quite amount of detail of you know unpacking the the arguments you know pro and con so let's get to some of the questions about sort of content and specific objections and things like that uh, Richard from Inverness Scotland asks what particular untruth that is used to support Darwinism irritates you the most and would you and you'd like to dispel once and for all <sighs> Well, uh, I, I, I think it's uh, the overlooking of all the molecular steps that are necessary to make observable changes. You often see stories in um, the newspaper, magazines, where uh, it says um, scientists show that uh, this thing evolved from that thing. And, um, uh, you know, the... Um, uh, and, and they're speaking about organs or features. And all of those things uh, are underlain by many, many molecular steps. And to understand what evolution, unaided evolution can do, unguided uh, evolution can do, you have to look at each of those steps, ask whether that's uh, can be, uh, can be, that pathway can be uh, traversed by random steps and selection. So I, the thing that uh, disturbs me most is that people have their focus, you know, understandably on larger features because that's what we can see. Uh, but evolution must occur at the molecular level and, and uh, most popular uh, magazines and uh, newspapers and so on overlook that. Okay, yeah. Um, Wes from California says, can you comment on what seems to be a growing trend among scientists who profess a belief in Darwinism but admit that based on new genomic and epigenetic findings that, that human DNA could have been seeded by intelligent civilizations from other worlds? basically a Prometheus argument. Is, that, is this argument now shifting to two sides of intelligent design? Well, I, I have to admit, I, I haven't heard that one before, that uh, specifically human DNA was put on the earth. A uh, long time ago, some folks may recall that Francis Crick, a, you know, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA with James Watson, proposed that life on earth might have been seeded by space aliens, but he was thinking of uh, tiny single 
uh, celled organisms that might grow up and evolve into into uh, all of life on Earth. I haven't heard anybody talking about specifically human DNA though, but it's true that the more we see, and this is the relentlessness of science again, the more we discover, the more and more controls that are seen on DNA, the more regulation, the more uh, sophistication. And so even folks who aren't uh, willing to uh, entertain the idea of design by, uh, by something outside the cosmos, outside the universe, uh, are you know drawn to proposing uh, design by some other uh, entity such as you know space aliens but I don't think most people will uh, will uh, find that idea persuasive okay um, an another person actually has a list of questions which I'm are all good questions but I can't get to all of them so I'll choose one of them could you describe what the adaptive mechanisms, or, or I think they mean how the adaptive mechanisms of any organisms have a limit? So I guess the, the, are there limits to the adaptive mechanisms of organisms? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, well, as I, as I write in Darwin Devolves, uh, the book that was published in 2019, organisms can adapt to environments and they seem to be able to adapt by a Darwinian mechanism. That is a mutation comes along that helps them in a certain environment and they, they and their progeny increase and they take over the population. Uh, the problem is that most of those uh, mutations, uh, the ones that help are degradatory, degradative, they break genes. That is they essentially sacrifice a gene that's holding them back in a particular environment. And while that does fit them more closely to a niche, uh, it makes them more evolutionarily fragile because now they can't, they don't have as much genetic information to spend if uh, the environment changes again. So they can adapt to more and more uh, specialized niches, uh, but then they're going to get stuck. So there will be a limit. And, and again, in, in the book, I argue that the limit is at the level of uh, somewhat below family. That is that you can might be able to get new species with Darwin's mechanism, maybe even new genera, but nothing at the family level. Okay. Um, I have a question actually from someone here in Washington State, Dean from Spokane, Washington, that actually follows off of what you were just talking about. He says, in your book, Darwin's Devolves, Darwin Devolves, you say that the most adaptive mutations are really the breaking of genes. A Darwinist would counter that there are millions and millions of mutations underlying the evolutionary tree of life. So have you examined all those adaptations and included them in your claims of broken genes? I have my own retort to that, but I'd like to hear yours. Well, um, we, we look at examples, the best examples that uh, current science knows about. It, it turns out that the ability of science to determine what mutations are uh, helping a species has only been available in the last 10 to 20 years. You have to remember that mutations are changes in at the molecular level of life. There are changes in DNA that cause changes in proteins, which are the molecular machinery that, that builds organisms and, and helps them grow and live and so on. Um, but the ability to look at that level, at the DNA level of life in sufficient, uh, in, with sufficient uh, resolution to determine what was helping and what wasn't is, as a very, very recent uh, ability. And in the places where it's been tracked down, the genes or the uh, mutations which helped species adapt uh, most strongly were, as I wrote in the book, uh, seen to be degradative ones, particularly in the polar bear, the top, uh, top dozen or 
uh, more genes that uh, allowed it to survive in the in the uh, Arctic uh, were the result of breaking or degrading genes. The uh, differences in breeds of dogs, Great Danes versus Chihuahuas versus French Poodles and so on, they've been tracked down at the genetic level too, and they are mostly broken genes as well. So there is no reason to think that this is uh, this would be different for for some uh, for some uh, unguided process in the past. This is what we see it doing. So uh, it's this is uh, the best explanation uh, that we have. Okay. Um, we have another question from someone who says they've just listened to your interaction with biologist Josh Swamidas on the show Unbelievable. I'd like to hear more about his observation that God's methods of design, etc., might be vastly different from how we would design machines. Sure. Uh, for folks who don't know, uh, Josh Swamidas is a biologist at the at Wa uh, Washington University in, in St. Louis. And he's a uh, Christian and he uh, is a design uh, opponent. And uh, yeah, yes, uh, recently he and I were on a podcast together and he said, uh, raised an objection that I've heard before is that, well, you know, God is completely different and you know the way we uh, uh, that the way that we finite humans design things is not uh, the way that God does. He he has you know his own ways which are unfathomable to us, and that's fine. You know I don't disagree with any of that, but it doesn't matter because design is perceived in the designed object or system itself. It's not, it does not require you know the methods or the ways in which the designer worked. For example, um, suppose you were out hiking and you turned a corner and you saw Mount Rushmore and you had never heard of it before. Uh, when you looked at it, you would not know when it was made, you would not know who made it, you would not know how it was made, and so on. But you would know immediately, without any doubt, that that uh, sculpture was designed. It was not an accident. It was not the result of weathering, a strange weathering event. So if God made Mount Rushmore, he could use methods and whatever uh, that are unfathomable to us, but we perceive the design in the final system. So, uh, so uh, that objection, I think, uh, doesn't matter. And that's one of the uh, strong points of uh, design is that you do not know, you do not need to know the history of the uh, object. Uh, you only need to see how it is now, you know, how its parts uh, are fit to each other right now. Okay. Um, someone asks, what's your favorite Star Trek episode? <laughs> uh, let's see, what was it? What one? Uh, uh, it's the one where, uh, where, um, where Captain Kirk and Spock and Dr. McCoy go back in time. I've forgotten the name of it. Oh, they yeah. go through the suit. Is it like tomorrow is the go... edge of forever or something or tomorrow? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's and they, uh, they land in the 1920s and uh, there's a, a woman peace activist <laughs> and uh, she falls in love with Captain Kirk, of course, and, but she gets killed at the end. And uh, Yes, uh, something at the edge of forever. forever yeah, something. Okay. okay. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's certainly up there. <laughs> okay, great. Now we know. Um, do you have a favorite error? This is another question. Favorite error from the Kitzmiller versus Dover judgment. A favorite error. 
from the error. error okay, yeah. yeah. My favorite one is is um, when the judge John Jones quoted uh, the uh, opposing lawyer as saying that the science investigating uh, the immune system was not good enough for me. And the judge put those words in my mouth. That is, he misattributed a quote, uh, an obnoxious quote <laughs> from the lawyer uh, to me. Uh, I was on the stand and uh, uh, the uh, opposing lawyers had cooked up a stunt where they would take a bunch of books and put them in front of me and a stack of uh, papers from the literature and, and say, you know, well, you know, look at all this scholarship that opposes you. And uh, of course, none of it, you know, uh, contained, uh, contained uh, experiments or uh, arguments to show how the immune system might uh, arise by a Darwinian process, uh, but that doesn't matter. And the, uh, the attorney, who is of course trying to make you look as bad as possible, the, the opposing attorney, said to me, so, he says, so do you think these, these papers and books, they're not good enough for you? They're, they're not good enough. And I said, no, they're wonderful. I'm sure they're you know, great papers. They just don't address the questions that I asked, meaning the mechanism of, of evolution, Darwin's mechanism, not common descent or relatedness. And in, the, uh, in his, his opinion, the judge attributed me, to me the quote that these papers and books were not good enough. And that was also written into the God delusion, if I'm not mistaken, by Richard Dawkins. Uh, he spent a little bit of time uh, on my arguments and he says, why well, look at what uh, Judge Jones, you know, uh, uh, how uh, be he dismisses the, the, the work of scientists. So yeah, that, that's the, that, that got my goat. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, that's, that's the one. Okay, someone else asked where, oh, and by the way, uh, someone actually uh, gave us the actual title. Uh, thank you for submitting City on the Edge of Forever. That was for oh, the okay. Star Trek episode. Yeah. Okay, so, someone <laughs> else asked, where does randomness fit into an intelligent design approach? For example, how do you fit humans who have evolved to being able to breathe, and evolved is in quotes, or adapted to being able to breathe at higher altitudes, say in Tibet, uh, into an ID paradigm? Well, uh, if, you, uh, if you were a designer, you, one could imagine that you could make or design an organism so that if it found itself in different niches, it could adapt to it by losing information or by getting rid of a, a certain system. So with humans, uh, yeah, if they go to Tibet or the Andes, mutations can come along that help them breathe more easily at the low oxygen pressures, uh, but they're, uh, they are degradatory mutations. Additionally, you know, if you have humans in environments that have malaria in it, malarial parasites, they can adapt too in sickle cell and and uh, thalassemia and so on. But again, uh, almost all of those are degradative mutations. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it fits in pretty well, I think, from uh, an ID point of view that you make a line of organisms th that uh, can change within limits, uh, can change and, and fill various uh, niches in the world. Mm. Um, this person asks, uh, how has advocating ID affected your professional career? Do negative professional consequences hurt the advance of intelligent design? Uh, let's see. Well, um, they haven't hurt my career nearly as much as they have other folks. I'm pretty lucky. I have tenure before I got involved in the design discussion. 
you know, I'm no fool. I, uh, uh, and, you know, it's clearly true that people in professional biology don't like ID one bit. And some of them are activists and they will try to make your life unpleasant. But uh, Lehigh has been very good to me. You know, they've written a statement where they say that, oh, these ideas are be his own, we don't endorse them, but they've let, you know, haven't tried to stop me from publishing or discussing or going out and giving talks. That is different for other people. I've known folks who have lost jobs, uh, grad students who have been kicked out of laboratories and so on for advocating intelligent design. Um, so yeah, that does in fact put a pall over the discussion of intelligent design. You can't discuss it if you're a, in a vulnerable position. That is, if you're trying to uh, get a job or an education in sciences, particularly biology. Uh, and so that inhibits the free discussion of it. But in a sense, it makes it you know, dangerous and exciting too. So uh, perhaps uh, that makes up for it. Okay. Um, we have someone who writes, uh, you speak of us being like Borgs insofar as we defend, depend on cellular nanomachines. Of course, we are more than just a sum of ourselves. Humans, for starters, have spiritual souls, but even apes or cats or bees or plants have a principle of being, which Aristotle would call souls. One criticism of ID I have come across is that it requires one to buy into a mechanical view of the universe. My response to that is that there's more to us than the cellular nanomachines, but we are not less. But have you any comments about the integration of the cells into a life form such as man? Or, the, or this, I'd, myself, I'd say this complaint that an ID view of nature weds you to a mechanical view of nature, that we're just machines. Uh, okay, I, I, yeah, I've come across that too, and I don't agree with it, and I, I don't think it really has much force. As you say, John, and as the, as the questioner says, you know, just because parts of us work just by simple mechanical means, you know, your fingers are, you know, levers and pulleys and so on, uh, that doesn't mean our minds are uh, machines. And it doesn't mean that the whole of us put together aren't uh, much more than, say, the sum of our parts. Uh, nonetheless, you know, portions of people, you know, clearly are machine-like or are machines. The heart is a pump and it can be replaced by a, a pump uh, for a while. And um, the eye is a, like a movie camera and so on. And you can study these using the principles of science. And, uh, you know, again, the conclusion of design depends only on your knowledge of the structure of a system. It doesn't depend on knowledge of how it got there. So even if living things, you know, uh, are not machines in a, um, in a, a non-living, uh, in the same way as non-living things are, nonetheless, from the way you can put things, you see things put together, you can easily conclude that uh, the things that I've written about are, are purposely designed. Good. Um, so I'm just trying to, okay. Ever since someone else has said, ever since grade school, I've intuitively been struck by how awesome rowing uh, cilia are. Now that I've read your uh, free Kindle sample, I see how the elegant mechanism works, but my awe in light of the design has only radically uh, increased. Is that awe, that sense of awe, bad, good, or neutral for science? Oh, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, well, uh, who was it? Socrates, Aristotle? I think Socrates who said that uh, philosophy begins in wonder. You know, and so the sense of awe is, I think, all similar to a sense of wonder. You say, look at those things all going together, paddling along. Uh, I think it's, well, it, it's, I think it's very helpful uh, for science. And even though some folks can get sidetracked saying, oh, that's 
really not, I mean, it's neat, but it was just put together accidentally. Nobody really intended it. Uh, still further investigation, as you say, shows more and more and more uh, elegance and sophistication and, and drives you to deeper and deeper uh, states of awe. So eventually I think it it's, uh, does get uh, people on the right track and it will eventually get science on the right track that, uh, that we to appreciate the, the design of, of life. Okay, so um, we had a question here about uh, whether you thought endogenous retroviruses provided strong evidence for evolution. And so I'd like you to reflect on that. But also there was another question that I think I'd tie into it. If someone asked, well, what do you think is the strongest evidence for, for Darwinism, if you had to make it, you know, what, what's this, the strongest argument? So first, the, the specific argument about endogenous retroviruses, is there anything that that somehow supports a Darwinian view? And regardless of how you answer that, what is the strongest evidence for Dar Darwinism that you think you know, says something for it? Yeah. Okay, for, well, for endogenous retroviruses, for, and for any listeners who don't know what that is, they're little pieces of DNA in our genome that strongly look or strongly resemble the DNA of, uh, of uh, viruses, some viruses. And the idea is that they uh, got into our genome and uh, uh, are, is, are also passed along uh, through the generations simply by uh, by uh, being inherited. And it turns out that some are similar to, uh, some that humans have are similar to other species and uh, some that uh, some mouse species have are similar to uh, other, uh, other rodent species. And so they have been uh, argued uh, to be strong markers for common descent. And yeah, that's fine. Maybe they are uh, indeed uh, the result of common descent, although I've, I've heard other arguments about that too. But just for purposes of discussion, say, okay, uh, they uh, point towards common descent, but they don't say anything about Darwinism versus design. Uh, they don't even say that the viruses arose by Darwinian processes. And, the fact that they are in different uh, species DNA doesn't say anything about why the species are different or how they got their specialized uh, specialized features. You know, if the if the um, retroviruses found in say giraffes were the same as those found in cattle, you've still got the same problem trying to explain where how giraffes might have uh, come about. Okay. Um, what was that second question now? So, and the second, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked it so I could highlight. The second question actually came from Martin in the Czech Republic. We're getting questions from all over the world. What argument do you consider the strongest one for the support of Darwinism? Okay, the strongest one, well, uh, let, let me just say, I don't think there are any, but <laughs> okay. this, if I have to pick one, it's that, you know, some organisms have surprising features that we didn't expect. And people say, you know, why would God or why would a designer uh, put such things in creatures? Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of the a blind spot in the eye and uh, um, the, uh, and Darwinists would say, well, no uh, self-respecting designer would have allowed that. And someone back in um, Darwin's day um, was asked what his, uh, a biologist was asked what his work showed about the intentions of the deity. And he says that he has uh, a, uh, an overly fond, uh, overly fond view of beetles because there's lots and lots of species of beetles in the world. So uh, it, and, and also of course, uh, Things like uh, uh, wasps lay um, uh, 
uh, wasps. Uh, oh, I've gotten this wrong, but, <laughs> but uh, there are parasites and parasites seem icky to us. So why would a designer make things like that? And there, you know, species go out, uh, go extinct. Why would a designer make something and allow it to go extinct? And there are easy uh, responses to those, but nonetheless, it seems to be the a very appealing argument or a very intuitive argument that seems to reach a lot of people. Uh, so they don't know why some feature exists or why this relationship exists. And they ascribe to uh, a designer, they say that, well, you know, this designer would have made things differently. I would have made things better, they think to themselves. I wouldn't allow this suffering to occur. I wouldn't have allowed this, uh, this feature, which seems non-optimum, to occur. And uh, since Darwinism says that it's pretty much just nature red in tooth and claw, and you have to expect uh, uh, bad things to happen, that seems to be a strong argument. Uh, it's essentially an argument from evil or, or related to it. And I think that's the strongest one for Darwinism. Okay, so we're um, now just in the last, I'll try to fit in a couple more questions before we wrap up because we're almost out of time. You seem to have a lot of readers uh, or, or people interested in Scotland. So I'll take one more from there. Louise from Scotland <laughs> says, is there any critic that you think did engage your work properly and who did acknowledge your responses? Um, well, that's a good one. That, that's, that's why I like Scotland so much. They, they ask penetrating <laughs> questions. Uh, Let's see. Um, I can't, maybe John, maybe you can <laughs> help. I, I can't think of anybody where I've gone around and around with them. Uh, Ken Miller, I've gone around a couple times with, uh, but very unsatisfactorily, I might say. And uh, I've, I have gone around with a, a man named uh, Lawrence, um, uh, what's his name on, on Sandwalk? Uh, oh, uh, Larry, yeah, Larry, Larry, Moran. Larry Moran, Larry Moran. Yeah, that's he's a, a retired biochemistry professor from the University of Toronto. And again, uh, I went back and forth with him a number of times, but it was rather unsatisfactory because we simply couldn't agree on even what the terms should be. So I, I We'll have to say that no, I I haven't really. Most people don't engage, and the ones that do, uh, uh, somehow we we fail to communicate. Yeah. I mean, you did have the the extensive back and forth with Richard Lensky, didn't you? Uh, on online. Um, I mean, I'm again. I'm not saying that he had the better arguments because he didn't, but at least he yeah. he did make an attempt to engage, yeah. sort of. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say that really. I mean, okay. uh, yeah, Lensky, Lensky, Lensky was one of the co-authors of the Review in Science sure. of Darwin de Paul's, and of course, he's a very eminent scientist himself. And after that, he posted uh, four blog posts on his site going into much longer depth. Um, and I responded on Evolution News, but he never responded to my responses. He never yeah, okay. engaged my responses. Okay. Uh, so that was- yeah, I, 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 was, I was trying to life. put the best, you know, I try to be Pollyannish, try to think uh, yeah. best of people. Uh, yeah, final question yeah. from someone. Wouldn't Kenneth Miller's argument, biologist Kenneth Miller's argument, which you've already talked about in a bit, uh, still be supporting intelligent design theory when he says that one part is usable in different systems. That's what we do after all. We create tools that can be used for multiple purposes, such as nuts and bolts that can hold together a television or a bookshelf, for example. Sure, yeah, I mean, that's, that's fine. Uh, you can think that a part can be used in different systems and uh, that can be the result of purposeful design, but I don't think Ken Miller in that was arguing for intelligent design. 
Additionally, you have to, in these particular cases uh, of, you know, this part can be used over here or this can be co-opted for that. You always have to remember that when we have a nut or a bolt, we put it in and decide where it goes and how it connects other things. And if we're going to use it in a different arrangement, we, uh, we have to manipulate things different. In the cell, if you have a nut and a bolt, they don't, uh, if you have two pieces that are originally not together, and it would be helpful if they did stick together in a certain way, they have to develop what are called binding sites. That is surfaces that are geometrically and chemically uh, complementary so that they can find each other and stick. And if you need a half dozen parts, then all half dozen have to develop these binding sites before you can have a system. So even if parts of one system might, if modified, be used for another, it doesn't affect the problem of irreducible complexity because you've still got to adjust everything to each other. And while you're doing that, if the system is irreducibly complex, uh, it will not be functioning as the final system does. Great. I think great thought on which to end. Um, I want to thank you for participating, Mike, and for the hundreds of people who participated, for the dozens and dozens and dozens of questions that we got. Sorry that I couldn't get to all of them. Um, one person asked whether uh, how they could share this Zoom cast with others, and we have been recording it. And so assuming that the recording turns out, it should be posted, I'd say, within a week to, to maybe a little bit more than a week. Uh, for on our Discovery Science YouTube channel. So that would be the easiest way to share it. Um, I'd also, in addition to thanking Mike, I'd like to thank our behind the scenes producer for this event, our educational and outreach coordinator at the Center for Science and Culture, Daniel Reeves, uh, for doing the technical uh, production. Oh, good, yep, yeah, Daniel, you can see him <laughs> on that. That's great. Um, I'd like to just, uh, Please buy Behe's book. It's a great Christmas gift. Uh, be prepared to, uh, you know, really be entranced by it. Dr. Behe is a great writer. He makes science come alive, even for those of us who uh, are not scientists by training. Um, I know that Mike's writing has impacted many and many of you. Some of you expressed that in your comments that you sent. Uh, uh, not questions, but comments. Just a few weeks ago, we actually had someone post something online that talked about how he cried after reading Mike's book, Darwin's Black Box, and then he hugged it. So it wasn't crying, um, I think it was crying out of tears of joy, not out of, not because you depressed him, Mike, uh, and he hugged the book. I can't promise you that you will hug this new book, although it's certainly large enough for you to get your hands around, um, but feel free if you, if you want to. Um, before we go, I'd like to alert you to an upcoming uh, another webinar on Friday, December 4th with biologist Dr. Richard Gunasekera of Biola University on the emerging field of nanomedicine and how that might relate to intelligent design. It's sponsored by the Southern California chapter of our science and culture network. Uh, and so you can go, you can see discovery.org slash ID slash events to get more information about uh, registering for that or, or by, uh, for that event. And then one final thing, um, this is sort of the season of giving, as you may or may not know, the Center for Science and Culture uh, at Discovery Institute is a nonprofit organization, so we do rely on donations. I want to thank the many of you who joined today who are actually donors and contributors uh, to us. Uh, you made the publication and distribution of this new book possible, among other things. Uh, if you aren't a donor, but you think that this debate over Darwin and intelligent design is important, I just hope you might consider a donation. And there's an address, discovery.org slash ID slash events. And so you could consider that. That's all for now. Uh, bye until next time. Thank you for spending part of your Saturday with us and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.